Hey everyone, it's Kim. Sorry for the glamorous setup, but hi from the UK. I made it to London. So this will serve as my unofficial intro to the vlog footage. Um, I am in London for work. I've mentioned it, I think I mentioned it on like my most recent book haul video. And... So it is three o'clock on Sunday. I flew overnight and landed in London around 10 a.m. Traffic was awful from the airport to London. I did not expect it to be that bad. Um, my driver told me that there's some protests going on. Like um, the people who run the tube are on strike. So that's why everything's taking a, a lot, lot longer. So I got to the hotel probably around, let's say one o'clock, 12.31. Um, unpacked, freshened up, had to do a COVID test, um, not to enter the country, but because I'm going to be on set for work along, around other people. Um, we got COVID tests done, which, hey, I'm all for extra COVID precautions. And then after that, I went to the Daunt bookstore. Before I, before I get into the bookstore, I should say I have already finished a book because this is kind of an unofficial reading vlog as well. I finished The Billion Dollar Burger by Chase Purdy. I read this as an audiobook. Um, I tried to sleep when I was flying. Um, I left at seven o'clock from Buffalo, then I flew to JFK. I had a layover, then I flew to London. Um, but I couldn't, I, I'm not someone who sleeps the entire night, even on a plane. This isn't going to happen. So I did read the book. I'll put the picture like here, I guess, in post-production. Um, can I make this any better of an angle? We'll see. That's a little better. There you go. Lighting is still awful. Um, so I read The Billion Dollar Burger. So if you have heard of this title, I've referenced it on my channel as five books about burgers that you should read. Oh my gosh, you really need to read this book. So this book is all about a two-year examination about the, the growing industry in food tech known as cell-grown meat. And it was so fascinating. So cell-grown meat essentially is the idea that we are going to be able to create meats such as beefs, protein from chicken, ducks, etc., in laboratories without the need of actually slaughtering animals. The idea is that you will take cells, not just stem cells, but cells from a living organism without killing it. Um, and then they use this for like patented or um, it's like a proprietary solution. And this solution, essentially, it's kind of like the fermentation of beer, but it's the fermentation of cells. And we can actually make food with it. And it could, you know, 14% of our CO2 emissions globally are coming from CAFOs, commercially agri commercial agriculture farming organizations. So big beef, big cattle, um, the poultry industry, it's, it's really destroying the environment. There's lots of negative impacts to the environment. And we as a global civilization and as mankind will not survive on the growth rates that we need more meat to feed our growing countries and our growing populations and we're running out of space um we're destroying the planet so the idea is that these lab grown meats or um cell grown meats man-made meats whatever you want to call them uh could be part of our future and chase purdy really talks about a bunch he examines eight different small startups some coming out of silicon valley some coming out of israel some coming out of japan that are all on the race to be the first to market. I really thought this was an interesting space and something that I'm super interested in. Do I think, just would I eat cell-grown meat? Yes, I would, I would try it for sure. Do I think it's gonna be perfect? Not right now, no. Because if you think it's a very, you gotta think about this book and it doesn't get too overwhelming, but it's these questions that I'm even stumbling through articulating in my review to you guys are the same things that Purdy, the author, is dealing with. Is it an animal? No. Or is it yes, because it was derived from cells of a living animal, but no animal was killed. So is it vegan? Yes. But what does it taste like? Um, so by cloning cells, they're, you know, they, they're cloning muscle cells. Let's say you start with muscle cells. And a lot of the technology where it is right now, we only have the technology to kind of make like a chicken meatball. Um, something that's very much like a pureed structure versus when you think of a chicken breast, you ever like break a chicken breast apart and you can see like the strands and how certain things are like woven together. Or like when you buy a cut of meat, you're looking for the marbling, a mix of intramuscular fat and beef, things like that. Well, technology hasn't gotten there yet. Or I mean, this book came out a year ago, but this is what Purdy's examining for about two years. It's super fascinating. Do I also think that this will completely replace uh, traditional agrarian farming? No. 
do I think we need to get rid of commercial agriculture farming organizations like CAFOs? Yes, I do. I, I am. We need to get those out of the environment ASAP. I'm hoping for a future. After reading this book, I'm so pumped. I'm so jazzed up. I think it's fascinating. I hope for a future where we still have small farmers, artisanal farmers, where the person who spends two years raising that cattle to make into food is paid what they deserve because it is a quality long-term investment like wines. And I think that I really hope that in that same world, we also have these lab-grown meats. This is this, we're a man, we're a society that wants protein and we want it now. But the idea, and I guess, forgive me, there are no studies yet that show this will reduce CO2 emissions by X percentage because it's not commercially ramped up. It's not like in your whole foods yet, but I think it can get there because it's not using the CAFO model. Um, there's some preliminary studies that the author references from out of 2011 about what positive impacts um, cell slash lab grown meat can bring to the environment. I am all for this dual combination, 1000%. I really, really liked this book. Also, Purdy narrates the book himself, which you know, I've said it a million times, but anytime an author is gonna narrate their own book, I'm way more invested, I'm way more interested. So yeah, I am already one book in and I loved it. I, I can see that book being in the top 10 for 2022. That's how much I loved this book. I am not a food scientist, I, but you guys do know, I've mentioned it before, I work in food. I, I develop products for a living and I work for a large commercial organization. And I, the more I develop in my career, the more I feel I get disconnected to my food. And it's, it's well, Kim, is lab-grown meat really gonna like bring you back to your food? Not really, but it's activism at its core. It is activism to change the environment, to save the environment, to save animals. It's a very interesting conversation also on a philosophical level of the role of the nonprofit and the role of capitalism. If, and this is, I'm paraphrasing, but like if vegans, can vegans take control of capitalism and use it to bring monumental change using some of the learnings of the nonprofit sector? The book has me convinced. So I also mentioned that I went to Daunt Books and I'll cut some clips in. So I, I mean, I'm a bookstagrammer, I'm a booktuber. I have known about Daunt Books for a long time. This is my first time in London and I finally got to go. And it's 10 minutes from the hotel I'm in. I just went for a walk, it was great. First, I have to say, why do you guys in the UK have such better covers than us in the US? Um, I saw the cover for Crying in H Bar, Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner, and it's this beautiful, like, mustardy yellow. Gorgeous. Um, not that the red hardcover is ugly by any means, but, like, there's just, um, when the coffee gets cold, I saw it in the store, in Dawn, and it was just amazing. And I, you guys just have some really beautiful striking covers, so kudos to you guys. So when I went to Dawn, there was a book, so I follow a couple hashtags on Instagram, like hashtag food writing, for example, and there is this book for two years I have been waiting for called In the Kitchen, Essays on Food and Life. And it's a collection of essays and Daunt Books has posted about it before. And I promised myself that when I went to Daunt, whenever that was, I would get this book. So I did and I got it for 10 pounds, so not bad at all. And the book is 175 pages. And I guess Daunt Books publishes some of their own books because I'm looking in the back of the cover and it says, founded in 2010, Daunt Books Publishing grew out of Daunt Books independent bookstore with shops in London and the south of England. We publish the finest writing in English and in translation from literary fiction, novels and short stories to narrative nonfiction, including essays and memoirs. Our modern classic list revives authors whose work were unjustly, who have unjustly fallen out of print. These books are printed in striking editions with introductions by the best contemporary writers. And in 2020, we launched Daunt Book Originals, an imprint for bold and inventive new writing. So it's really cool to see like a food writing anthology coming out of an independent bookstore. And I'm so glad I got this. I did pick up two other books. I mean, I, when's the next time I'm going to be here? I'm so pumped. Um, I did put two books back. So I had five. I got it down to three. I'm pretty proud of myself. This other book, um, Scoff, is all about the history of British food, um, a history of food and class in Britain. And I really don't know anything about British food. Um, I loved the cover. I really like whoever designs their covers at Daunt. 
I think Dawn... Oh, no, this is published, I'm sorry, by Atlantic Books. But either way, I'm super excited. Um, it's it's chunky. See, you can see it's a pretty chunky book. Um, but I don't know anything about it, and I'm super, super, super excited. Oh, they put a bookmark in each of them. Look how pretty this bookmark is. And then the final book I picked up at Dawn is from an author I have never heard of, which is always exciting in, in the food writing space. And this is Table Talk, Sweet and Sour, Salt and Bitter by A.A. A. Gill. Um, from the back cover, it looks like A.A. A. Gill is um, a writer who's been writing for the Sunday Times and Tatler in the UK. So I think Gill is a well-known food writer here in the UK, but it's not someone I'm familiar with. So I am I love when I'm meeting a new author essentially dating a new author to pick up something like an anthology of some of his published and written work. Because if you are skilled enough to be published in newspapers, kind of like a dying art, uh, you have some skills. And I'm very excited to pick this up. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. I have three new food writing books and I've already finished a book and I haven't even been in London for 12 hours. I'm trying really hard not to fall asleep though. Um, it's only like 3.30 by the time I'm done filming this. But, so I'm, I'm not going to go to sleep though. I I do feel like my feet hurt. I've been sitting on a plane. So it's like really frustrating because I, uh, back in December, I dropped a 50 pound weight on my foot. Uh, I didn't break it, but I did have to go to the hospital. I had to wear a boot. I got x-rays done. But because of it, and I knew this was going to happen, I my feet, my foot's never going to fundamentally be the same. So like going for long 30 minute plus walks doesn't really work on my foot. It just starts to really almost burn and really hurt. So I need to sit. I need to put it up for a little while. So I am back in my hotel room. Duh. Um, but I do have other books. I have my laptop. So maybe I will just like play some games. I don't want to go to sleep. I know that if I go to sleep now, I mean, I could take a nap. Like I, I've made it. I slept overnight. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm in the right time zone on the right cadence but I don't want to take a really long nap or anything. So I'm going to put my foot up. I also need to find a grocery store because when in another country, you have to find snacks. I also forgot face wash, so I need to go find some face wash. So my goal is to put my foot up, maybe hang out for an hour, find a grocery store. And then because I'm here for work, I'm pretty sure the rest of my team's going to be like, hey, do you want to get dinner together tonight? And that's fine. I don't really want to start a new book though, because I don't know about you guys. I kind of have like book um, fatigue. I just finished the book this morning on the plane. So I want time before I start the new one. But I did bring other books with me. One is Miriam's Kitchen. This is part of my Unwrap My TBR, which I'm on my fourth book of trying of February, trying to unwrap my TBR. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but I have this book with me. And then I brought two fiction books with me. I brought Like a Love Story by Abdi Nazmain. And I haven't finished it yet. Um, I, I made a good chunk of it the last time I was traveling. It seems to be a book I like to read when I'm traveling and not any other time. And then the other book is a brand new arc I got from Penguin Random House. This book comes out on March 13th. And it's Sadie on the Plate by Amanda Elliott. And this is a foodie rom-com. So there's a good chance because my brain is so fuzzy that this is going to be the book. If I pick up anything tonight, it's probably going to be this book. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give you guys that update. I am going to vlog throughout the week. I'm probably not going to vlog anything on set. You're probably going to get a lot of me here in the hotel room at night and maybe when I'm out and about on the streets, but uh, work is a confidential thing, quite obviously. Um, so you're probably not going to see me on set at all. But that's it for now. Bye. Hey, everyone. So it is actually already Wednesday night, the final night of my European adventure. So I haven't updated you in a couple days. So let's go back to, let's roll the camera back. Monday, I ended up having more time to explore all of London. And I ended up going to a tea shop, which name, it, it completely escapes me already. Um, something in M, T and M maybe. I'll put the name right here. I went to this tea shop because I promised my family, my sisters, my mom, everybody wanted tea. So I went to this tea store and I walked there. Um, on the way, I must have found like rich Gucci Avenue because I have never walked by so many designer stores in my life, which is very intimidating. Uh, people of London, you dress very well. You all look wonderful. Um, this tea shop had four different floors, which was super exciting. The bottom floor was like a grocery store, but like expensive grocery store. I really wanted to get cheese. And then I realized I wouldn't have a way to get it back to the States without like really smelly luggage. 
Um, and then the top floor had perfumes. Um, perfumers are told, called chemists. Uh, very luxurious, my goodness. And then the main creme de la creme is the, the teas and the chocolates. So I did buy myself some tea. Um, I already packed my suitcase because I'm leaving tomorrow morning. So maybe I'll cut to a clip when I'm back home and I'll show you guys the teas I bought because I bought myself some tea. I bought my mom and both my sisters these little three packs of tins for tea and I bought my mother-in-law some tea. Yeah, I bought a lot of tea, a lot of tea. I actually spent more money on tea than I did on books. That's, that's saying something. I bought Dan um, chocolate orange slices. Dan loves these like really gaudy looking chocolate covered oranges that you can get around um, Christmas. And I think they're gross, but I'm at this really fancy tea shop that also has its own like chocolatier on staff. And I was like, okay, these look legit. Um, so I got him some of those. I found gluten-free biscuits for myself, which makes me super excited to have with my tea. And I bought a little four pack of truffles for Dan and I to try. It was a really wonderful store. Um, I love the old architecture outside and going inside the four floors with the staircase in the center. Very beautiful, really whimsical. And then I walk outside and I turn to my right and there's a bookstore literally next door. I could not, I did not know that it was there. I did not plan to find this bookstore, but there was this bookstore. And um, looking at the sign, it's one of the oldest bookstores I think in all of London. And I had to go in. So from the street though, I have to say you have a storefront and you can see it. And then if you look up and I'll, I'm putting the clip here and this is kind of my voiceover, you can see that there's actually two buildings above. They're all the buildings are attached, but this bookstore has expanded to the point where they own both of these buildings that are attached. So when you go up the different floors, you can actually, if when you moved to the left past the staircase, you actually had to take a step down and you could tell, I could tell I was in the other building. It was a really cool experience. Um, this bookstore is from the 1700s. It had this plaque from the queen. It was awesome. Very old school. I loved that there was carpet everywhere in this bookstore. Um, there were little couches you could sit at. And of course, there was a beautiful food and cookery section, as they called it. And that was awesome. It was a little strange because cookery was past the children's books. So you had to like go past like Dr. Seuss. And then I had this whole room to myself of cookery books and it was wonderful. There was a whole section for food writing or cookery writing, two whole entire bookcases. I don't think I've ever seen that much, especially for an independently owned bookstore, or at least it has to be independently owned, I think at this point. Really, really cool. And of course I bought books. Of course I did. But I just have to say it was just a beautiful setup. There's lots, I actually had like eight books in my hands and really started to put things back because I was trying to like not get wrapped up in, oh, I'm here and I need to have it. One thing I did notice is that the UK has these beautiful new bindings of all of Anthony Bourdain's books so that they're all the same height, made of the same material. And then the spines are different colors based on each of his books. I almost bought the whole series right then and there because I just really love the idea of that. And I do think I'm going to put that on a wish list for myself for a future gift to myself or as a Christmas gift or something. Um, if you're new to my channel, Anthony Bourdain was the person dead or alive I wanted to have dinner with. Uh, still do, dead or alive. Um, he, to me, is the epitome of food and storytelling. And as his career moved on, it was less about just food to know food history, but let's learn about the people, the culture, food and folklore. It, I think Anthony Bourdain was a really complicated human being and unfortunately he died by suicide a couple years ago now but was very impactful to my life um so i really want those books i also saw all of jay rayner's books jay rayner is a food critic out of the uk um you might reckon recognize that name from top chef masters if you watched it in the u.s and i really wanted all of his books too but i put all of them back because i knew i could get them elsewhere so i'm going to show you the four books i did pick up so first off, I picked up this book, Swindled, by B. Wilson. If you don't know who B. Wilson is, she is a well-known British food historian. Um, she has some books like Consider the Fork, which I have reviewed on my channel, which I'll link in the cards, and What We Eat Now. A very important food historian. Now, Swindled is one of her earliest books, and I have had a really hard time finding this book. It's from 2008, 
And I think it's almost, it must be out of print in the U.S. Because I have never found this even on thriftbooks.com. Um, so when I saw it, I knew I had to have it. And Swindled is from poisons to sweets to counterfeit coffee, the dark history of food cheats. So it is about food adulteration. It is about um, swindling us, essentially. Bad food has a history. Swindled tells it. Through a fascinating mix of food politics, history, and culinary detective work, B. Wilson uncovers the many methods in which swindlers have tampered with our food. I love that even the back of it, it's like written in cursive. It's such a beautiful book, very old school looking. And 2008 doesn't feel like such a long time ago, but it's 2022. So this is a 14 year old book at this point. Um, it's close to, let me think. It's about 300 pages, give or take. If you are doing the history a thon, um, which I know literally Bookish is co hosting, this is a great um, history related prompt. It would hit, I think it would hit a bunch of different prompts, honestly. Um, she writes for a topic. She's from the UK. She's talking about food from other countries, etc. Uh, she is a historian herself. Pretty excited to read this. I'm really excited to have it in my collection. I mean, even look at like the cover. It's old school illustrations. It's this is the original cover in the sense that I've never seen it reissued or reprinted. It's always looked this way. The next book I bought, I actually got at the last minute and put a different book back. It is called Chasing the Dream, Finding the Spirit of Whiskey by Rachel McCormick. And honestly, I don't, I don't drink. I don't know a lot about whiskey. Uh, but let me read the back to you. And maybe you'll see why I thought it was interesting. Whiskey is Scotland's national drink and has been for over 500 years since, since then becoming a global phenomenon. It is a drink that is profound and important part is a important part of the Scottish life and culture but unlike other countries with their national libations it is hardly used in food. Rachel McCormick is going to change that with this book. Limiting whiskey to a drink she believes is similar to the traditional Presbyterian attitude of sex. It should only be done with the lights off and in the miss missionary position. Rachel believes that there is an entire Kama Sutra of whiskey out there and she has she has put it in this book. Interspersing an engaging mix of antidotes and and anecdotes, excuse me, history and information on distillers and recipes. This book will appeal to everyone from from the cooking whiskey connoisseur to the novice whiskey learner, learning from the guidance on what to eat and cook. Rachel travels to the lengths and breadth of Scotland, discovering a myriad of unique and interesting facts about this remarkable drink with interviews with the key people who created around the country. She visits the famous distilleries as well as some more homegrown varieties. And I honestly think this is a great book for me because I don't drink whiskey, but it is interesting that of all the spirits and liquors that I've heard of and read about, I've never actually really seen whiskey in food. So I'm really like this hit, this hit the back of the cover, caught me hook, line and sinker. So the last, so the third book I got is The Apple Orchard, the story of the most English fruit. So I have a couple different books on apples, but I've always let, read about apples through the lens of the United States. I'm from New York. I'm from the Big Apple. So I'm actually really interested to see um, England's apple growing history um, and the magic and folklore around this familiar fruit. I'm pretty excited. I also thought the cover was stunning. It's a nice like watercolor illustration. And I also got Oranges. So Oranges is by John McPhee, and he apparently has is just a very well-known non-fiction writer because look at how many books this guy has written he has a lot of books in there so it looks like he writes on a variety of topics not just food writing um i've seen there's one i'm looking at his insides raising from the plains a sense of where you are the pine barrens silk parachute the founding fish etc um but again oranges i don't read a lot about um let me read the inside for you in penn station in Penn Station was a machine that split and squeezed oranges. They rolled down the chute and were pressed against the blade. Then the two halves went in separate directions to be cupped and crunched. The juice fell into a pitcher. You paid dearly for it. Inspired by the glass of freshly ske squeezed orange juice he bought every day in his morning commute, Pulitzer Prize winner John McPhee takes us on the remarkable journey in a search of the world's most popular fruit. Under his trademark style and enchanting wit, he unravels the rich history and fascinating cultivation of this botanical marvel. Beginning in beginning with the fruit's origins in Southeast Asia, McPhee travels from the greatest orange, orangeries of Louis the X is ten. 
five is the so one in between Louis the Fourteenth to the shores of Andalusia and through the endless groves in Florida. Along the way, he introduces a he introduces the people whose livelihood depends on this the world's insatiable demand for the fruit, orange pickers, a citrus scientist, and an orange baron worth over twenty million dollars. I'm super excited. I'm hoping this also introduces me just to a writer I don't know, and I'm really going to enjoy. I'm sorry that the lighting's a little dark in here, but I'm very limited. Like, I have one light, um, and then I have, like, lights next to my bed. So hopefully, maybe in post, I'll boost this up a tiny bit. Um, is this any better? Can you see? <laughs> you, you get the idea of what I'm dealing with. So those are the four books I got from the bookstore on Monday. It is now obviously Wednesday. So what have I been doing? The last two days I've been working, which is why I'm actually here. I can't show you guys what I'm working on because I'm filming a commercial for Halo Top, which is my regular nine to five, which for an ongoing disclaimer, anything that you have seen on this YouTube channel is a reflection of me, myself, and I, and not my company. I always have to put that disclaimer in in case anyone at work ever found my YouTube channel. These are my opinions. They do not reflect the company's opinions. I digress. I am, I was on set for two days working for for work and um I finished today and we got back to the hotel probably around 5 30 and I went oh my god I gotta go to Waterstones and Rita from Rita by the Books told me of a specific Waterstones I was supposed to go to that um is the original before it became a franchise and I honestly got a really bad headache and laid down for an hour and then it was 6 30 and dinner's at 7 30 I went all the way downstairs I was about to hail an uber and by the time the uber would have gotten there and got me to the bookstore I would have only had 20 minutes inside to run around and film and then leave, including any checkout. And I just, it, I know I'm going to come back to London. I want Dan and I to come here on a vacation. So I think the next time I'm in London, I will go to a Waterstones. Versus these other two bookstores I've seen the last couple of days, Daunt Books and the other historic bookstore, um, were much more exciting, I think. I, Waterstones is a chain versus Daunt has multiple locations, but it's still independent publishing, you know. I've also picked up seven books. I really don't need any more. I'm probably already over the weight limit on my suitcase. So I'm going to have to um, carry these bags as a carry-on, put it up above. Just a, ba a bag full of books. Um, so sorry, Amrita. I, I tried. But I really do think I'll be back. London was beautiful. There's way more places to go, way more things to eat. Um, next time. So what have I been reading, though? So I'll admit that I've been getting back to the hotel at night and really not wanting to read a lot. I did start Miriam's Kitchen. I'm about 30 pages in. It's for a separate video for my Unwrap My TBR. And um, it's the fourth book I've tried to unwrap and read for the month of February. And now we're into March. So my goal is if I don't read it and finish it on the plane to knock it out over the weekend when I'm home. Because I'm going to get home on Thursday at 7 o'clock. And then I took Friday off because I'm going to be super jet lagged. Um, I don't know why, but I made an appointment to like go to the bank and do some adult things. I really wish I hadn't done that. Really wish I hadn't done that. Um, oh well. The other book I started is The Lentil Underground as an audiobook. I do own this book. It is wrapped up on my shelves. Um, so it's kind of like unwrapping another book off my TBR and I am three chapters into it. I really like it. I don't know a lot about lentils, obviously. Honestly. Not obviously. Honestly. Um, and it really starts with the narrator used to be like a country music star and then realized that she didn't really enjoy opening up for like Leanne Rimes and stuff. And she decided to go into food, and then she's going into food and archaeology and agriculture, and then decides to study the lentil. And I'll admit the first few chapters was a lot of her setup, and I kind of was half listening to it because I'm on set with one earbud in. Um, so I have about five hours left on it, and I'm hoping to knock that out on the plane. I was also listening to it at just regular speed. Maybe if I can give it my full attention, I can speed it up to 1.2 which is literally the fastest I can do. Um, it's not a race, though. I shouldn't feel like it's a race to read books. Um, I just like the idea of finishing the a book through the flight because I finished the Billion Dollar Burger on the way here. Um, but yeah, that's what I have. Um, I've been filming for about 15 minutes, which means I probably only have half an hour until I have to go downstairs and go to lunch with, go, go to lunch, go to dinner uh, with my team and the agency I work with. And then when I get back upstairs, let's say dinner's at 7.30, 8.30. Um, my car picks me up at 8 a.m. tomorrow, so you will probably not see any filming until I am back in the States, so I'll see you later. <sighs> okay. Hello. It is the Saturday after the London trip. I am back. I landed on Thursday. 
and had one of the worst flying experiences of my life. Um, the actual flane on Thursday was fine. Um, I got really close to having no one sitting next to me. Um, literally the last person they let on the plane sprinting down like the, the aisle was the guy next to me. So I kind of, I kind of hated him. It's not his fault though. I mean, he bought a ticket. He's entitled to his seat, but I was like so close to not having anyone next to me. I could not sleep on this plane. I tried reading my books, like physically the books, like some, you know, the fact that I bought seven books on this vlog and brought three with me. I tried to read and I got really, really motion sick. Um, I read a book. I did listen to a book and finished it um, called The Lentil Underground. I didn't finish it till yesterday uh, in the afternoon. Um, and there's a whole, that's part of my unwrap my TBR. So I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, it'll, it's either going to, that video is probably going to come out before this video, but you, I'll link it up there. I get to JFK and I have less than two hours till my layover. And on the plane, they said, don't worry, don't worry. You're going to get to customs and there's going to be a uh, quick connect line. We get to, we get to customs. And the people basically went, basically said, Fuck you No, that line doesn't exist. And I looked at them and went, my plane starts boarding in 49 minutes. What are you going to do to help me? Look, I am, I am normally a very kind and gracious traveler. Okay. And I didn't yell at anyone, but I gave them this Persian look of what are we doing? Cause I'm not missing my flight. So they let me cut to the front and then they put me on a line. And then I begged people on that line to let me cut to the front. Tw it takes 20 minutes to get through customs. Uh, I would have missed my flight 1000% if I had not asked for help, asked for a favor. You know, I try, I, I genuinely don't think I came off as like a Karen, uh, but I normally don't ask for favors ever. The only other time I cut a line at the airport was when I was flying home um, to see my dad before he passed away. Oh, sorry, trying, oh, emotions, emotions. Um, sorry, it's a little triggering. Um, so I get through customs and then apparently you have to go back through security again, like take off your shoes and your belt. Someone explained to me how the plane from London, I land and I have to go through security again. Like what did I do? Pick up a bomb mid flight in the air? Like, are you kidding? And then they take my water bottle from me that I bought at the London airport that had to have gotten through their security in London and went through on a plane. Like, what did I do? Make a Molotov cocktail in the eight hour flight I had? I was pissed. But when I realized it was the bottle, I said, officer, it's the water bottle, please take it. I, I gotta make a flight, I'm so sorry. Like, that was a dumb move, sorry. They insist on looking at all of my bags. Now, my bag, I have checked a bag, but I have a bag and my personal bag. The ba the other carry-on has my new books in it. Seven books. There's nothing else in this bag but the books. She takes every book out, and I didn't find out later till I got home, she ripped one of the covers of my brand new book. She ripped it. I don't care if it's only a little inch and I can tape it. She ripped my brand new book I bought in London. I was... Guys, then I get through security and I have 20 minutes to go from like B1 to B48, uh, which is like a 15 minute hustle through a crowded airport. I've also been on a plane for eight hours, so I am cranky as shit. I get on my Buffalo plane and it's Delta. Now, I know I'm not a small person. I'm not exactly a very large person either. And I could barely get my seatbelt on to the point where I thought I was gonna have to get a seatbelt extender. And I recognize it's a first world problem. I probably could have just asked for an extender, but like, I just felt like the guy next to me sat down and asked me to take my jacket off because it was draped over the armrest a little and then continued, continued to like uh, shift the whole flight and like clear his throat. Like, I'm sorry, you're fat shaming me because I can barely fit in the Delta seat. Also, I found out the Delta seat belt is 36 inches wide. I'm sorry, I'm a size 16. I'm, I am size 14, 16, average American woman size, and I can barely fit in the seat belt. And you, sir, clear in your throat, don't man spread your legs. Maybe if you put your legs together, like a lady, you'd fit in your seat too. So but then I get off the plane. I am <laughs> miserable at this point. And then my, there's Dan waiting for me with a bouquet of flowers. Like, oh my God, my heart. I was so happy to see him. And then we wait for my bag. And then 35 minutes go by and the conveyor belt has stopped. My bag is not there. 
my bag that has both of my work computers in it. Look, I get it. I, pr I You should never check your bag with your laptops in it. I get it. But I did not have the arm space or the bags to carry it through security. I didn't have the time. The one time I check a bag with a laptop, it's not there. So I have to go to the little like office um, to knock and be like, yo, where's my bag? No one's there. So I have to go up to arrivals. It's now like eight o'clock at night in New York. I have now been awake and traveling for 12, 13, 14 hours. 14 hours? I think 14. She comes back downstairs and she's like, well, you don't have your bag number, so I can't file a claim. I'm like, lady, I barely know where I am. I don't even have my tickets anymore because I had paper tickets and they got lost in the shuffle. So I go home, I take a shower, I eat dinner in bed, and then I call. And thankfully the bag showed up on a plane from JFK to New Buffalo Friday morning. I had to drive to the airport and go get it. I got it. Everything is fine. Um, but it was a really dramatic way to end a trip. Um, really stressful. Between my flight from London to New York and then New York to Buffalo, I also found out that two people on my production set tested positive for COVID. So let me be clear though, to leave London, you have to have a negative COVID test. So we all got negative COVID tests on, thir on Wednesday to get on our planes on Thursday, but apparently one person tested again uh, before they got on their plane and tested positive. So he couldn't even leave London. This guy's still in London. The other, my coworker, landed, got home, wasn't feeling well, took a test, and his came back positive too. And I found this out between flights. I was stressed as hell. Um, I have now tested myself at home on Thursday, and then again, it's Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And I've tested pop negative, negative, both times. And I tested negative before I left for London. So I think at this point, I'm okay. I definitely have a cold, and I think that's just travel. You know, I feel gross, you travel, you just get a sniffle. But I did cancel. I had a couple of like things I needed to do on Friday that I canceled um, just to, to lay low. And today my goal is just to edit this video and get it up and uh, my unwrap my TBR video and then call it a day. Um, so this was like a very tumultuous, dramatic trip to London. I have seven books that I bought, which I have shown you. Oh, and then one more book came in the mail. Hold on. And while I was gone in London, one more book came in the mail from me. And this is Technically Food Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat by Larissa Zimbaroff. Oops, I'll get that later. Um, so a new book came for me while I was gone. I'm super excited. And NetGalley approved me for a foodie rom-com audiobook. I'll put the picture here. Um, I'm about 27% through it already. It's I just needed something pretty like mindless to listen to. It's, I love it so far. Really fun, really slow burn, intense love here. Very slow burn, it's it's tantalizing. Um, and then I also got approved for a digital e graphic not foodie graphic novel for kids. Um, but I downloaded it to my Kindle, but it's like not working, so I'll have to figure that out because I don't want to. I'm trying really hard to work on my kit, my net galley score. Um, and I really want to read the, the it's like a middle grade book, I really want to read it. It's middle grade March, it'd be perfect timing. Anyway, sorry, this is a not a very dramatic outro, I realize. Um, but I hope you enjoyed going shopping with me in London. I'm super glad I got to go. I'm really sad one of my books is already ruined. Um, and let me know in the comments below, the next time I go to London, where should I go? Should I have gone to Waterstones? Is there another bookstore I should go to? And which of the seven books I picked up are you most interested in seeing me maybe vlog about or do a book review on? I post new content every Tuesday and Saturday. If you haven't already, I would love for you to hit like and subscribe and leave me a comment down below and I will see you in the next one. Bye.